I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 104, The Aftermath of English Dominance. David and Llewellyn's head adorned the walls in London. The war was over, for now, and Edward ruled Wales fully and completely. With that in mind, he determined that native Welsh rule was also at an official end. There would be no more native princes of Wales. Instead, that title would be given to the heir apparent of England, the soon-to-be-born Edward II, who was born April 25, 1284, in Carnarvon. An apocryphal story, of course, grew up out of this, uh, around the records of a Welsh clergyman named David Powell in the 16th century, under obviously very different monarchs. It was suggested Edward gave his son the title because he was born in Wales and did not know English, as was required by the local nobility. Most research says this is only a story and likely fabricated to add Welsh grievance with Edward, as would happen over the years. Edward I did quite enough that he didn't really need that particular offense added to the list of his general disregards for Welsh ideas, culture, and history. To give an example, Edward tried to ensure Welsh loyalty. He would do things to try and show the end of Welsh idealism and cultural ideals. Uh, as stated before, Geoffrey Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain was a very popular bit of storytelling mixed with some flavors of history and truth. The idea of the old British being descended from the noble Trojan Brutus, the same guy who was then claimed to have killed the giants, those mythical figures who had built Stonehenge and settled what we now call Britain. The Welsh desire for a noble myth was key to how they saw themselves and how they understood their former place in the world. Mythology is important, and nothing more so than the founding myth, which links Britain to Rome and from Rome to Troy, a ancient and disappeared nation. Much like Hengist and Horsa, of course, which were keys to Anglo-Saxon stories, they were just about as unlikely. So, therefore, an ever-embellished story of Arthur was a key medieval Welsh thought about themselves. Arthur was a link to a better past, the golden age of Welsh control and a better future, literally the once and future king. So, with this in mind, monks at Glastonbury Abbey developed a rather convenient story in the 12th century, claiming that they had found the burial spot of Arthur and Guinevere, complete with a note saying, Here lies Arthur, buried in Avalon. It has long been suspected that this was more of a fundraising ploy to gain pilgrims and to, and to help pay for new buildings in a time period when the hottest selling book that was published was talking about this said king in the aforementioned Kings of Britain. In 1278, Edward, on the other hand, found this little location of convenience to drive his conquest home. At this point, point, of course, there was still was a Prince of Wales, even if in only in name. The Welsh, of course, did not believe this person represented Arthur, and even Gerald of Wales remarked that the Welsh maintained that Arthur was still alive, which he unkindly prefaced by calling them stupid. In other words, they stupidly believed. So Edward dug up these two skeletons to prove once and for all that their hero was in fact fully dead. He unearthed them, describing them as large. The woman is beautiful. If that skeleton was female, we don't have any idea. Uh, no idea how he figured out 
any of this, of course. Uh, apparently, he then created new tombs for them. They were black marble with a lion at each end and an effigy on, of Arthur on the foot of the tomb. We know this from records and comments from the 16th century. Then Edward and his queen, Eleanor, wrapped them in silks and finery and then placed them back into this new tomb. His message could not be more clear. England won, and we are here to stay. No dead king is coming to save you. In the wake of the death of David, the boundaries of the kingdom of Gwyneth largely went to the king of England. David's sons in prison died in captivity, as mentioned last week, and the daughters of Llewellyn and David were spent the rest of their days in English monasteries, kept away from procreating new challengers, kept relatively comfortably by the kings of England. With his victory complete, Edward in the spring of 1284, along with his allies in council, decided the fate of the former free nations of Wales, including those of his allies, of those former native princes. On March 19th, he presented the new reality to the Welsh people called the Statutes of Rudland, or the, also referred to as the Statutes of Wales. Areas in Wales under crown control, such as the, kingdom, the former Kingdom of Gwynedd, would become English-style counties, and they would also establish the whole of Wales would now use English common law and English finance as the main market and legal forces. We'll talk a bit more about market changes elsewhere, but the legal changes were ones that were so critical in creating Welsh discomfort in the first place. It's interesting to see how this was immediately now the new fact of Welsh life. It did not unify Welsh territory completely into the English system, in part because, of course, the marchers were still laws unto themselves, and many of the native lords likely would have balked as a complete uh, unity with the English traditions. Welsh traditions and laws were seen largely as antithetical to the English way of thinking, and certainly Archbishop Peckham, who we'd mentioned previously, specifically did not like them. But Edward did keep a few of them. Inheritance laws were modified. They were kept as previously, but now excluded bastards. But all male heirs other than that had right to the land, still. Also, dispute mechanisms remained mostly Welsh in Welsh lands. So if there was a dispute between two Welsh people, it went to a Welsh overlord, effectively to judge, rather than to an English one, or the crown. Criminal law and disputes involving the court and English rules and judgments were, in other words, kept by the English and were all based on common law. As mentioned previously, castle-building programs of Edward were far and wide in Wales, most of the evidence exists to this day, 700 years later, and it is a symbol and a potent one at that. Do not mess with me. We are now the power. The message could not have been lost on the remaining aristocracy in Wales or in the common people. From Carnarvon, Harlech, Balmeris, Conwy, and areas in and around the edge of places like Aberystwyth and Bulleth, as well as Welsh castles, like the ones at Crickheath, which were then modernized to, and modified, which they themselves dotted the landscape of the coasts of Wales, while the English built castles that controlled key points around the Welsh lands in the middle, and especially, of course, in Gwynedd. Many other infrastructure projects happened throughout Wales at this time, centralizing and likely modernizing the way the countryside and urban areas worked. All of this security and enforcement came at a price, of course. It was estimated, for example, that by 1301, new castles cost the king £80,000, which roughly works out today to $65 million. Also, another goal of Edward was to move more English people into Wales to influence cultural change, like what had been done in southern Scotland and parts of Ireland, and, to be fair, in the Welsh marches to this point. As a sign of dominance, Edward, when he returned to London, likely to a hero's welcome in 1285, he brought with him the former treasures of the Welsh monarchy. The golden ones, of course, he melted down, and the other one, which was a relic of the so-called Peace of the True Cross, was then given away and treated as 
a holy relic, but still, you know, not a sign, a sign of his dominance and his control. As Wales became more English in other ways, it also became more integrated with the English systems of towns, monies, and laws, as we mentioned earlier. Coinage in Wales had not been used regularly for transactions since the time of the Romans. Llewellyn had tried to bring something of that forward, only to have it fail miserably. And this has always been one of the issues that the Welsh kings and princes had to deal with, as they were dealing with a trade economy as opposed to a a market economy. But that now comes to an end. The English wanted coinage used, and they would make sure it was applied to all. Even as the Welsh complained about it inf how it infringed on the old ways, the old economy was done, at least to this extent. Likely for taxation purposes, money was used more generally than before, but the day-to-day -day level of markets, in other words, in the communities in the countryside, were likely still a trade-purposed economy. In other words, you brought wool in, I gave you back beef, that kind of idea. Um, so it wasn't like it was a massive sea change of everything was turned to coin. It was more the fact that the day-to-day -day living was probably still trade, but the actual dealing with the government and dealing with government issues were now you need coinage, which becomes obviously very important at this point. It also makes it a lot easier for the English to tax the Welsh because you can put a denomination on it and come up with equivalencies. No longer do you say, well, you need 20 hides of cattle or 10 you know, pounds of beef. You have to bring in this many coins, this many shillings, this many pounds. I'm Elise Hugh. And I'm Josh Klein. And we're the hosts of Built for Change, a podcast from Accenture. On Built for Change, we're talking to business leaders from every corner of the world that are harnessing change to reinvent the future of their business. We're discussing ideas like the importance of ethical AI or how productivity soars when companies truly listen to what their employees value. These are insights that leaders need to know to stay ahead. So subscribe to Built for Change wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words, a podcast that presents the unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. As a country, we need these stories more than ever. Stories from Americans who have borne the battle, including 30-year-old remastered interviews with veterans from World War I recounting their time in the trenches of Europe, and with veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and from our most recent conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other battlefields Americans may never have heard of. Hear their stories by listening to Warriors in Their Own Words wherever you find podcasts. And that's your obligation. And of course, it's much easier to track and easier to control. So all of this would make sense and would also drive the economy forward. However, in the years after the conquest, Edward faced further troubles in Wales into the 14th century. In 1287, Rhys ap Merduth of Duithbarth, a one-time reliable ally to Edward, even after he lost his ancestral seat in Dunnanfer, finally got fed up with how the king had been ruling in favor of the English nobles over him in disputes. Rhys likely had had little support, however, from the common people or Welsh nationalists, as he was a bit of a Johnny-come-lately to the fight. Obviously, he was one of the few to stay out of most of the battles of 1282 and 83, and was an ally to Edward previously. So the English mustered 24,000 troops, including Welshmen from the marches, to put down this revolt. In the end, the English besieged Rhys at uh, Men were then drawn from construction sites across Wales, and massive trebuchets were built, which were effectively the medieval heavy weapon of choice until the invention of the cannon. Rhys would then escape and lead the English on a bit of a merry chase until 1292, where once again the Welsh leader was given over to the English by his own men. He would then be dragged to his death and executed in that manner. As a result, another Welsh native leader was gone, and much of his land became a part of the Marcher counties. The final and largest revolt of this period, and probably the most notable, happened in 1294 and 1295. 
much again over the nature and taxation that had been going on. Wales had still been heavily taxed 10 years after the end of the war, in fact, much more so than its English counterparts. And as most of the area of Wales was poor, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize how much this would hurt and how much this would draw more and more grievance once you learned how much your neighbors in the English counties were paying versus how much you were paying. Edward himself was locked into the beginnings of trouble with the French over land and was looking to find funding for expeditions into the Plantagenet holdings in France to try and defeat them. At the same time, he was having troubles in Scotland, which will become more and more important as the time goes on here. But for the moment, they were only just really kicking off. On September 30th, 1294, a group of Welsh infantry, which had been summoned to Shrewsbury as part of this call-out of men to go to France, revolted. This was the match which led a flame of rebellion across Wales to English rule. At this time, many of the regiments in Wales were depleted by needs in France, and there were not enough English troops in Wales to stop the rebellion from growing. And within a month, so by October, many of the castles in the north and west of Wales had fallen, and a number of the notable royal officials were also killed. Wales' anger even went into the towns and castles surrounding them, Places like Carnarvon were burnt down, and the castle had its own walls destroyed. Um, this was a much more complete uprising even than 1282 and 83, and the anger of Edward's structures, his leadership, and his laws boiled over, and much of the native-born nobility were effectively dragged into it with their commoners. In the north, Madog ap Llewellyn, an offshoot of the Powys line from Llewellyn the Great's Laid, led the resistance in the north. In the south and east, other rulers came to the fore who were likely driven by this popular sentiment rather than leading it. Years of grievance, going back to at least 1277, combined to make this a Robert the Bruce-style moment for Wales, an opportunity where one single leader might have been able to drive them into a popular revolt. That, who knows if it would have come about that they would have won, but there was a possibility with the distractions that Edward was under at the time. Unfortunately for them, this wasn't a uniting of all of the various forces of Wales, and in fact, all of those divisions that had previously existed remained in place even at this point. And it would, even though it was a huge revolt, and it would be the biggest until the arrival of Owen Aplindor to the scene, it still was piecemeal and disorganized. The English response came swiftly in November. Henry de Lacy led a failed attempt to relieve Denby, only to find his tenants turn on him in the process and had to flee. He would actually pay for that because the king held him responsible for that. Castle Iberi was burned at this time as well during an attack that would then be abandoned by the English. And again, it took five attempts, but John Gifford finally relieved the English forces at Billeth. In other words, effectively, the English were in a bad way. Edward must have realized this as he moved to muster the forces of the English to defeat the Welsh. These were forces that were supposed to fight in France, but now were distracted by the Welsh uprisings. By late November, they were preparing for yet another three-pronged attack into the various parts of Welsh lands across the marches. This time, the English attacked with 35,000 troops, a substantial increase from the attacks in 1282. The English, as had happened twice before, pushed forces into the Welsh and ground them back down. But in what was considered to be an ill timed and ill-considered move, Edward attacked Conwy and was hoping to lead from there into the rest of Snowdonia, perhaps with the hopes of finishing the war before turning his attentions north to the problems that were now kicking off officially in Scotland and would eventually lead to the rise of William Wallace, for example. Instead of a resounding victory, the king and his men starved at Conwy due to his baggage train being attacked and supplies not getting through for the better part of a month. The king sat in Conway for that month, only finally moving forward after that in March, once his own men forced his hand. 
Uh, attacks in the spring went better for Edward, and in early March, Madog was defeated in mid-Wales. The fight was a terrible one, and Madog and his troops were outnumbered and surrounded, but were unwilling to simply give ground amongst all of these attacks. But, unlike Llewellyn, he was able to escape. However, his defeat and eventual capture would effectively doom the revolt. Without its natural leader, the rest of the forces weren't really able to hold out very well. And in the north, the real end came in April of 1295 when Edward captured Anglesey and uh, would actually, in the end, build Bomar's castle, which he would actually raise on the ruins of the town of Flenflaes, which he actually moved across the island, all of those that lived there, just be out of sheer spite, people think. In June of 1295, Madog surrendered. He would be a guest of Edward in the Tower of London, but would live for many years, and actually lived on much nicer terms than previous guests of Edward. Edward himself returned to castle construction in Wales, which would see this ring of stone rise and remain until this day as a reminder of the conquest of Wales. And with that, we are at the end of Welsh independence, and we are at the end of this section of our story. I am, due to work concerns and other things, having to take a break from this podcast for the summer. Uh, I am going to work on some things over the month of August and hopefully have a go-forward plan with the rest of what I want to do with this podcast, uh, including talking about the revolt of Owen Glyndor, talking about mining in Wales and some of the major economic drivers in Wales that come both pre- and post-independence and driving forward eventually towards the modern era and the changes that come about because of that. But for now, um, I hope you all have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you in this autumn. Uh, until next time, everyone, take care. Have a great day. Uh, if you want to follow what I do, you can always find us at distractionsmedia.com. If you want to follow my travails and travels this summer, you can actually follow me at Linstead, L-I-N-S-T-E-A-D-D-M on Twitter uh, and on Instagram. And uh, you can also find us at the Facebook dot com forward slash Welsh history podcast if you want to comment and discuss anything. Um, for those of you that are following me on Patreon, uh, we have suspended and will keep suspended any payments there until I am back doing podcast. Uh, I don't think it's fair of me to take any of your money. So please be aware of that and uh, I will make sure that there are no charges to you at all during the summer. But uh, until next time, everyone, take care, enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you in the autumn. Bye! This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a hundred dollar bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.